This conference will now be recorded. So we are so glad to have Dr. Mansbach with us today. Dr. Mansbach is the founder and CEO of Mansbach Health Tools, LLC, which supports the BCAT Research Center. He's also the CEO and president of CounterPoint Health Services, which is a multidisciplinary behavioral health care company specializing in geriatrics and dementia care. And CounterPoint works with many of our members here in Maryland. Um, so some of you are likely familiar with with Dr. Mansbach and his team. And we are so glad to have him with us today to help us really dig into this important topic. And, you know, all of us are, are working day in and day out under extraordinary circumstances right now um, in a field that under normal circumstances is challenging and has a high burnout rate. And um, so we really wanted to, to discuss this topic more and see how we ourselves can be ensuring that that we are in the best um, mental health that we can be in, but also as organizations, how can we really support our teams and help folks um, effectively cope with the, the stress that we are facing caused by this pandemic? So Dr. Mansbach, I'm gonna hand things over to you and we so appreciate you being here today. Well, thank you, Allison. Hello, everyone. Thanks for, for joining uh, this call. I understand that people are exceptionally busy dealing with actually the topic we're gonna to talk about today, uh, COVID-19. Um, what I'd like to do is make this very practical, very applied. I will encourage you as I go through to think about specific questions, how it would apply to the work that you do every day, uh, make use of the chat. Uh, I will try to address questions mostly toward the end of the presentation. Uh, I will say that rather than focusing on the somatic uh, features of COVID-19. This conversation is very much about the psychological burden of COVID-19. So I'm really talking about an elevation in depressive and anxiety symptoms that uh, I would say most people are going to experience. And the focus is not so much on, on, on residents or patients that we take care of, but rather on the staff and, and leadership staff as well who are managing the centers and um, and care for residents uh, who or may not have uh, COVID-19. So this is really about psychology and not really about somatic health. And I think the paradigm I'd like to introduce is one of um, the trajectory of time. You should be thinking about COVID-19 and psychological burden uh, as a chronic uh, situation. And it would not be wrong to think about it in terms of PTSD, that is, there's a a traumatic event or a series of events, and it has a tail or a sort of a duration to it in some way. So I, I'd like to talk about what individuals can do to mitigate uh, the psychological impact of COVID-19, uh, both the actual um, uh, symptoms of the disease, uh, but also all the measures that we put into place. We think about them as safety measures, things like social distancing and PPE, uh, because it has its own impact uh, uh, from a psychological perspective. So it's what individuals can do, but increasingly it's what organizations should do to prepare not only for uh, supporting staff now, but supporting staff later. Uh, I'd like to be able to say we have um, a vaccine that is uh, soon to be arriving, but I can't say that because we don't. Uh, COVID-19 will not um, mysteriously be eradicated before the fall. Uh, so what we're really looking at is we're looking at peaks and valleys, surges and deflations in COVID-19 and everything that goes with that. So organizations need to be um, looking very carefully at what they can do now. They also have to be looking at what they can do later. So in this presentation, I'll talk about both I'm gonna talk about certain tools that could be made available. You might even think about them from an HR perspective. In particular, I'll focus on a, on a new tool that was developed at our research center. It's a free tool. It's called the M5 and rapidly being adopted. The reason why I want to introduce it to you today is that there's very good science on its ability to predict uh, the psychological burden that we'll be talking about. I'll break this conversation into, into three sections. I'll talk about COVID-19, um, mostly from this idea of, uh, of trauma. I'll talk about its impact on, on individual staff, if you wanna sort of be granular about it. But um, 
maybe even more importantly, I'll focus on what organizations, what you can do uh, now and later uh, to mitigate its impact, to retain your staff, to support your staff, because one of the issues I think that we are concerned about is, are we going to have a marginalized healthcare uh, delivery system? Are people still gonna wanna do this work? What can we do to make sure that the mission that we all have gets completed? So a little bit on background. Most of this, of course, you know, COVID-19, certainly this is the greatest challenge uh, any of us have faced from a pandemic standpoint, I think in our careers. Uh, but of course it doesn't impact everyone evenly, yet it does impact everyone. So we think about basic risk factors, certainly older people are remarkably more at risk. That doesn't mean that uh, younger people don't have their own expression of the disease, which is idiopathic, can be expressed in many different ways, uh, but, but clearly uh, older adults, uh, which I'll define right now as 65 and older, um, but, but it's progressive. So people who are 75 and older are gonna be more at risk than those who are 65 to 74. The comorbidity issue is important. That would be the, the health burden that people have um, while they might be exposed to the coronavirus. So, you know, issues like diabetes and COPD and uh, heart disease, uh, cardiovascular illness, things of that sort put people at greater risk. We certainly know already from the epidemiology that people who live or work in nursing homes, any long-term care facility are especially at risk. You know, you can look at the, the, the fact that less than 1% of uh, American adults work and live uh, in, let's say, nursing homes or senior living communities. And yet, if you look at fatalities associated with COVID-19, it's probably 30 to 35% of them uh, are people who fit into this category. So having some concerns, certainly uh, um, that would be um, reasonable to have them but there are things that we can do to mitigate and we will be talking about them. Now you may hear lots of ways to uh, understand COVID-19. I think the war metaphor, uh, you hear this all the line, the front lines, you are on the front lines, you are on the front lines. And certainly it's a useful metaphor to think about. Uh, it's not a battle, it really is a war, it's an ongoing situation. Uh, I mean, there are some limitations to a war metaphor, but I think in some respects it's, it's, uh, it's apt. Having said that, it would be important for us to start with an idea of what trauma is. If I'm gonna talk about psychological burden, uh, really we have to begin with, well, what starts the burden and what keeps the burden going? So uh, I use the, the SAMHSA definition of trauma. I think it's a, it's a reasonable approach um, for our purposes. Most importantly, uh, there must be exposure to a traumatizing situation. Um, it has to have an impact on our physical health or our psychological health or um, our spiritual well-being. It can't be a glancing blow, but it has to be something that has a, a staying power, something that um, uh, somehow we psychologically integrate. Um, so with no trauma, there's no PTSD. Uh, but so if we sort of look under the hood of trauma and we think about, well, what kinds of traumas are there, I would say that there are three primary ways of thinking about trauma. An acute trauma would be just, um, uh, let's say, in our, uh, for our purposes, psychological impact of exposure to a single um, uh, event. Um, I think in the COVID-19 situation for the work that we all collectively do, it might make more sense to think about complex trauma and vicarious trauma, sometimes referred to as secondary trauma. And I think in long-term care, we can think about it as compassion fatigue, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, during our conversation today. Complex trauma makes sense because it's not just one um, exposure, it's repeated exposure. So if you're working in a, in a center, you are um, dealing every day with uh, residents who may or may not have COVID-19, staff who may or may not have COVID-19, um, and everything around that from, you know, how do we change our work uh, roles uh, and habits uh, every day, and how do we quickly mobilize? So I think we're pretty much 
um, embedded in a traumatic situation. So that complex trauma is really important. I want to emphasize that uh, all people have, uh, you might think about it as a psychological reserve, the ability to absorb uh, distressing events without expressing um, depressive or anxiety symptoms. But there is really no one that is completely immune from them. It's really a function of how frightening it might be, the event. Uh, so, so an event that can seriously injure us or kill us, the high valence. So, so if you look at that and then you multiply that times um, the number of exposures, what happens is that you begin to think about trauma in terms of long-term effects. That could be things that affect our anxiety and mood, but even affect things like um, fatigue, uh, uh, appetite, um, our dream life, our relationships with our loved ones, and things of that sort, which, by the way, can get further complicated by sheltering in place. More about that later. One way to think about this lifelong or, or um, sort of ongoing um, impact of of exposure to trauma, in this case, COVID-19, this is sort of a worst case situation, but it fits into a PTSD model. So I, I will share it with you today. Um, so we start with an exposure to trauma. So if you look at this slide and you look at, you go to the left and you look at that first box, you say, okay, well, so that would mean then that we're working in an environment where there are COVID-19 cases and all the safety measures around them, including wearing PPE, including social distancing, all the things that actually um, inhibit or limit meaningful engagement, a really important part of our work uh, and, and our life. And you will notice that I did not put uh, a box to the left of this exposure to trauma, which I could have, which would be other traumatic events that we may have had. Because if we have been exposed to other traumatic events, then um, uh, our susceptibility to COVID-19 trauma is even greater. And I'll give you one sort of real life situation. I was asked to consult with a nursing home that had staff uh, from uh, a country that actually people um, had were refugees here uh, from uh, a genocide situation. So the issue here was these, unfortunately, these were individuals who were already at risk and the impact of trauma, of the trauma related to COVID was even more, more dramatic. Okay, so you're exposed to trauma, you experience some intense fear, some strong and negative emotion, feeling of hopelessness, horror in some cases, certainly um, uh, something with real staying power. If you do this over time, uh, there are potential neurological changes that can take place that diminish our capacity to cope with stress. Uh, if we had more time, I would talk about the neurophysiological response to stress. Many of you are, are quite aware of this and how that impacts on things like uh, our ability to find infection and things of that sort. But there are certain changes. The result, of course, being that we are more at risk for having anxiety disorders, having depression uh, and having uh, insomnia. And insomnia can be a symptom of either um, generalized anxiety disorder or major depression, but it can stand on its own. Uh, you don't have to rise to the threshold of having uh, diagnosable depression or anxiety and still have difficulty sleeping and difficulty with your, um, with your dream life. So um, maybe a nice way, a compact way to think about um, this situation and think about your staff now is to break down the stressors that they face into four bins or four different categories. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about some of the psychological issues, some of the social issues, some of the occupational ones, certainly you're thinking about that, and even some of the physiological or physical ones. And if I start with the psychological ones, um, we, if we take a step back, and we say, okay, uh, what's really going on here? What are we watching? What we're watching is an increase in suffering and uh, an increase in, in, in uh, mortality. So morbidity, mortality, this is greater. This is when you hear people who are invested in taking care of other people, particularly older adults and the work that we do, but then come to a conclusion that based on what we're seeing here, we didn't sign up for this. 
there's of course the real fear of being infected and, and not just being infected, but sharing, spreading this infection to people we care about, our loved ones, our spouses, our children, and in some cases, um, older adults that we, we take care of or we see. For some, there's a sense of anxiety or guilt about this potentiality, this, this possibility of infecting others. You know, think about it. If you think about yourself as a vector of disease, that at the very least does not feel good, does it? Uh, and, and of course, it's, it's at the opposite end of the continuum of why we get into healthcare. We don't think about ourselves as a, as a vector of disease. We think about ourselves as mitigating disease and suffering. And of course, there are social stressors too. So isolation from loved ones um, because we're concerned about infecting them. Um, and and I, what, what I'll say now, I was giving a talk about this um, recently, uh, and it was really around the business community, the, the pressure to open up and say, look, you know, enough is enough. And yet um, the health issues around all that, so there are economic issues, sure, but there's social ones. You know, you, you want to be able to see people uh, at summertime, all the things that go with that. Um, for some people, you know, they want to go to a baseball game with, with uh, 14,000 other people. Can't do those kinds of things. That's a stressor. Social distancing. Um, you know, in the beginning of COVID-19, we had an awful lot of um, confusion about, well, should it be six feet? Should it be three feet? Uh, what, what should social distancing really be? Does it matter if you're walking on, on a sidewalk and somebody's running, if they're exerting themselves, a force of air? There have been all kinds of calculations around that. But the bottom line is social distancing has an impact. Wearing PPE also has an impact. If you wear them, and you're, you probably everyone on this call uh, has at the very least worn a mask, but if you wear a mask and you wear a gown and you you know, you wear goggles or you wear a shield, you feel like you're part of a science fiction movie. And, you know, if you think about that, it's hard to emotionally, psychologically engage with other people when you're garbed in that way. And over time, that has an impact, too. And finally, the stigma uh, related to um, uh, it's really other people having contact with you and with residents. Uh, and, and, and an extension of this would be um, I was actually in a in a small uh, grocery store, and they had a sign. And they said, uh, "Healthcare people, healthcare workers, you know, we applaud you. You get a five percent discount, um, and come the last hour of 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 our working hours." So uh, that's sort of interesting. So I asked them about that, and they said, "Well, you know, you get a five percent discount, but we also don't want you to be around other customers." But you know, that's sort of an interesting uh, take on this. So um, I thought I would share that with you. Related are occupational stressors because we work in sort of social environments, if you will. So what we need to do, our expectations, they're rapidly changing. I hope now that we're three months into this, give or take, that the, the dust is settling a little bit. Uh, so maybe these expectations are shifting a little less, but they're still there. Many of us have had to take on roles that um, you know we're we're not used to, uh, and that brings its own anxiety and challenge uh, to that. For those of you who are taking care of um, of residents and you're working with uh, their families, you you really are dealing with a whole other factor of stress. So there are families that are going to be very angry about what you're doing, right? There are families that are gonna be supportive, but certainly um, the common denominator are families who are gonna be really anxious. I will tell you that for the first uh, six to eight weeks of um, the PHE, or the public health emergency, uh, we did a counterpoint a number of evening um, Zoom support uh, sessions with, um, with family members. And I, I tell you, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, but um, they really educated me on just the intensity of um, their anxieties, you know, and, and, and also anger about, you know, what's going to happen. And fear, I think, was really what was underneath all of that. And of course, trying to balance um, uh, sort of caregiving duties, uh, life duties with work duties. I think we can just talk about that as, uh, you know, work life balances are always a challenge, aren't they? But now, um, even more so. So 
what does this mean uh, sort of from physical terms? So, so this could be its own webinar. You know, there's a lot really to say about um, uh, the physiological reactions, the physiological stressors associated with all this. But just a couple things to, to keep in mind that, that um, if you're wearing uh, PPE, it would be important to remind yourself that uh, you need to stay hydration, hydrated, you need to keep yourself going. Uh, you can't just be caught in sort of the garbed uh, moment. There's stress related to being hypervigilant around infection control procedures. Did I wash my hands you know, before I saw this patient, after I saw this patient? Did I wash my hands enough before I actually had something to eat or something to drink? Uh, we know from uh, our own research and our own experience that sleep disturbance is um, is continuing to, to to be a problem. And, and I'm just going to say uh, there are a host of other um, physical things that are happening. Uh, so um, uh, on a on a sort of a, on an outcome physical outcome basis, it's not so much the stressor, um, but just the the production of headaches, GI distress, uh, things of that sort. Now, uh, because this conversation is, is about the psychological burden, it is important to think about um, the research that's already out there. So I'll talk about what we already know and a little bit about what we found in our, at our center at the VCAT Research Center. So uh, what we know is that the, um, the impact on everyday uh, people um, in terms of reporting psychological depressive symptoms has really uh, gone up. So this recent survey that got a lot of attention at Kaiser found that 45% of adults in the U.S. Uh, reported when surveyed that their mental health had been negatively impacted, um, really because of their concerns about the virus. Now, now this percentage is higher among um, healthcare workers. Uh, there was a fairly large population-based study done in China um, that looked at this very question. This is already older data, and we have newer data now, but basically the bottom line is, for those who are in healthcare, you're looking at a reporting basis of 70% or higher that say that they're, um, they report symptoms of anxiety uh, and depression. Doesn't mean that they meet criteria for clinical depression, but some of those symptoms uh, that's really high. This has been particularly um, pronounced in women, nurses, frontline healthcare workers, and in many cases, that's all the same person. Now, I'd like to present a little bit more on the model of um, PTSD and kind of give you a, a snapshot of what this would look like from um, uh, COVID-19 perspective. So, um, I mean, the first thing really is that uh, there has to be an exposure to traumatic events. So, so I think we can say the secondary trauma, a repeated exposure to an environment where COVID-19 is so much a part of it, is, is definitely um, meets the criteria for, for a stressor. This idea of re-experiencing emotional distress uh, also is something that we see all the time. And as I go through this, as painful as it may be, you can look at your colleagues, the, the people you support, yourself even, and see how you deal with this. This third issue I uh, hadn't talked about uh, until now, which is really um, a normal response to some, uh, some extent. And what it really means is that we avoid things that make us feel uncomfortable, almost in a phobic kind of way. So what would that mean for people who we're working with? They're, they're, they're exposed repeatedly in this sort of secondary traumatic way to, um, or maybe even a primary way to, to so they have a traumatic stressor, they're re-experiencing emotional distress, anxiety, fear uh, over time. So it's only natural to begin to avoid it. So this is when you have people who quit, people who um, wanna, wanna lessen the amount of work that they're really doing, an avoidant response, and by the way, this has got to be uh, a place where intervention um, comes into play that we'll talk about. There are also other things that happen. Uh, we refer to them sort of as a collection of negative thoughts or feelings or mood, uh, but the idea really is that um, you begin to distort in negative terms your own experience uh, emotionally and even cognitively. You begin to feel uh, more isolated, you begin to worry, are you getting enough support from, from others? You become more blaming. Again, this is a natural reaction to a 
PTSD uh, sort of situation. You'll have higher irritability, so you should expect that in your staff. They're going to be more irritable. They're going to be more accusatory. They're going to begin to call out more. They're going to begin to report more uh, physical symptoms and things of that sort. Now, to meet criteria for PTSD from a clinical standpoint, someone like me would be looking at this and saying, well, has this lasted for more than a month? Um, that's, that's a low bar, I have to tell you. It's not like three months or six months. So uh, we're already in that window. Finally, there's some functional significance to all this, uh, which is really that these symptoms can create real impairment, not just socially, but, but in terms of our work. Now, we can talk about depression and we can get very granular about it. I don't want to do that in the interest of time. What I will say, though, is that you should expect that uh, reports of depressed mood are going to be elevated. Um, and more importantly and more significantly, um, this idea of what we call anhedonia, which would be a loss of interest in activities that people once enjoyed, you're going to begin to see this. So as you talk to your staff members, you're going to be looking for things like that. And when we talk about the M5, which we will do in a few minutes, you can see that this, this is right in there. It gives you sort of a lens for, for doing so. But just to round out the conversation about depression, people um, often uh, report uh, change in appetite, usually less, uh, change in weight, that can go either way, but often less, insomnia or hypersomnia, more insomnia than hyper, but it can happen. Uh, psychomotor retardation, the more important thing about this is that you just feel slowed down. And I think anyone who's had a period of depressed or what we call sub-threshold depression, not quite major depression, but still uh, significant in that it impacts on our daily life. This is one of the things that we feel. Fatigue, um, you know, this is a little bit hard because we're probably tired anyway, but uh, more tired than, than usual. Um, and you can see the rest. Um, now, the, the sort of, um, uh, we think about mood in terms of sort of the, the two primary children of, of mood disturbance. One is, one is depression, the other one is, um, is anxiety. Generalized anxiety disorder is remarkably common. So in a nursing home, for example, you would expect anywhere from 25 to 30% of residents, let's talk about residents first, to have, uh, to have depression. If you look at the new data, and we've, we've reported a lot of this in the literature at BCAT, that um, it's almost as high for anxiety. Now, with COVID-19, uh, this 30% is, is a good figure for, for both depression and generalized anxiety disorder. I actually think now, based on our data, that GAD is more common than depression among staff. So this is, this is important. So this is about worry. This is about sustained anxiety. This is about difficulty in controlling thoughts and uh, emotional symptoms. Now, so clearly our staff are reporting, or if asked, would be reporting uh, more symptoms, what we call the psychological burden, right, of depression and anxiety. This, this, um, this other issue of compassion fatigue or secondary stress, I, I just want to, to pull this out so you are thinking about it now, and I want you to think about it in the long term, because this is something that is gonna be with us not just in June, not just in July, not just in August, not just in September, but moving forward for quite some time. It doesn't really, it's not a clinical syndrome. You know, We don't diagnose somebody with compassion fatigue, and all it really means is that Healthcare workers, not always, but often um, self-select their profession. They're, they're in um, healthcare because they want to make a difference, because they want uh, to, to be impactful, they want to reduce suffering. So if you're in a COVID-19 world, you see more suffering and more suffering than you as an individual have the capacity to mitigate or reduce. So this is, a, this is an important thing to keep in mind. It is an additive stressor for people. I just wanted to, to, um, to kind of bring that um, uh, to the forefront. Now, that's kind of the background. Let's talk about individuals and then let's talk about organizations. And then hopefully we'll have enough time for any questions that people have. So first sort of uh, individuals. So some of this is sort of in the world of HR, but it's mostly, I think, firmly in the land of leadership. 
So what I mean by that is you can make um, screening available for people. Again, this is around psychological burden that can be 100% private. It doesn't have to be anything that uh, you as a supervisor need to get involved in, but it does mean that making staff aware that if they have some concerns about psychological burden, stress, if you want to call it that, there are things that they can do and they can do it privately if they want to. We're going to recommend uh, two screening tools, one specifically for, for, for mood that is highly predictive of, of psychological burden specific to COVID-19, and then something about uh, PTSD. So um, I'm going to start with the M5. So the M5 is a new scale. Uh, it's been submitted for peer review. Uh, that's happening uh, actually right now. Uh, the first M5 study was based in, uh, in uh, nursing homes and senior living. I think there were 350 participants. Um, the M5 was created uh, because there needs to be a way where people privately can determine not only are they feeling anxious or depressed and do something about it, maybe having a formal evaluation uh, as an example, but there needs to be a tool that is sensitive to COVID-19 stress, and there isn't one. So the M5 was created. It can be done in less than one minute. It can be done online. Uh, it's free. Um, it was created uh, in a COVID-positive population. Um, it's adapted from uh, a, a mood scale some of you may know called the BAD, the Brief Anxiety and Depression Scale. It's used pretty widely in, um, uh, in long-term care, uh, likely because the science is good but also it produces a factor for both depression and anxiety, and so does the M5, so uh, that's important. The other thing about the M5 is that it's been validated for either, um, you, you can do it through telehealth, you can do it um, in an actual visit, or you don't have to do it with a provider at all. Any person can take the M5 if they want. So the science is very good, so, so psychometrically, it's reliable, it's valid, it can be used in multiple settings. Um, as I said before, it's, it's sensitive to, well, really this GAD, right? Generalized Anxiety Disorder and something called MDE, which is Major Depressive Episodes, or you can think about them just as, well, anxiety and depressive symptoms. Highly predictive of um, COVID-19. So what I'll say about that is that if you have, um, stress associated with COVID-19 that's interfering socially, occupationally, or somatically, uh, then the, based on the science so far, M5 has a 92% chance of identifying that. So if you have it and you do the M5, it will show it. It has a cut score, as you'll see, uh, of, of, of three. So here's what it actually looks like, very simple. Uh, have you lost interest in activities that you had found pleasurable? I'm not going to go over how you actually score it, but just give you an idea of the items. Do you worry about things more than usual? For at least two consecutive days, have you felt depressed, hopeless, or down? Are you feeling nervous, anxious, or wound up much of the time? Are you experiencing fatigue, headaches, stomach upset, or memory problems? Very simple, uh, but and the cut score is three. If you want to find it, uh, you can just go to a website you can go to enrichvisits.com and it'll pop right up there. You can use it in any way that you want. It's really for you. Now, another screening tool that we support, and we've used this also, we've done a lot of work with um, trauma-informed care. And there's, um, if you want to, if, you, if you're interested in it, it's free. There's a PowerPoint and video that talk about it um, in geriatrics and in long-term care, post-acute care. It's the PC PTSD-5. Like the M5, uh, you can use it whenever you want, or you don't need a professional. Anyone could can access it and so forth. Um, these are the five items. So the first one pertains to uh, nightmares or, or thoughts about an event that you were exposed to. Do you try not to hard? You try hard not to think about it. It's sort of in that area of avoidance. Are you constantly on guard? It, that's sort of a, kind of an issue of hyper alertness. Um, have you felt numb or detached from people, activities, or your surroundings? Do you feel guilty or unable to stop blaming yourself? Interestingly enough, for a positive screen, it has a cut score of three. Science is pretty good with the PCPTSD5. 
not as strong as the as the M5, but it's still a, a pretty good measure. Now, what can you do for yourself if you're an individual? Let's talk about that, and then let's talk about organizations. So, first thing I'll say is. Um, there's a free resource center for anyone. So if you have staff who, who want more information, all they have to do, there's, there's, um, uh, they can just email something called the resource center at counterpoint. It's, it's our, it's at our clinical company. It's manned 24 hours a day. It's not a referral source for people to get psychotherapy or medications. It's really, if you want to know more about, well, what is depression? You know, what is anxiety? You know, I'm having some difficulty with, I'm feeling more confused. So you can just tap into that resource. Um, I also want to say that as, as effective as the M5 might be or the PTSD-5, some people are going to need an actual evaluation. So it's important that um, they get there. And maybe the way to get there is to do a screening tool first. We advocate, and there's more information uh, in our resource center as well, we, we call this sort of, these are things that you can easily do every day for yourself called stretch, and it goes like this if we go through it. Um, first thing is sleep. So in our research, we say whatever normal, whatever no, is normal for you for evening sleep, let's say it's six hours, should be more, add one under stressful times. So it's, it's what we call N plus one or normal plus one hour. And the reason is that most of your neurophysiological housekeeping, the reparative stuff, repairing the impact of stress physiologically takes place while you sleep. So it does make sense, doesn't it, that if you're stressed out, that you have, um, you give the brain an opportunity to do some of that um, housekeeping stuff. Uh, that's important. Uh, tune out, all I mean by that is, Sometimes you just need to not be so overloaded by information. It's important. Maybe you say to yourself, you know what? From seven o'clock in the evening on, I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm not going to read about COVID. I'm not going to take calls and things of that sort. Reflection, I'll talk about this uh, simply by saying getting some distance uh, so that, for example, if you're feeling blaming, blame the organization you work for. Uh, it's important to get some distance. We have some guides for how to do that. Exercise, physical uh, exercise, get out, walk. Maybe you can go to a gym now. Maybe you can't. Maybe you want to. Maybe you don't. But there's lots of things that you can do. Also, cognitively. So the science now is really clear. You want to improve your mood, both depression and anxiety. One of the things that you can do when you're stressed out is do working memory exercises, very specific ones. You want information about how to do that? You can go to the resource center and we will send out information. Treating yourself really like you would treat a, a good friend is good. Checking in with other people, seeing how they're doing, sharing how you're doing, and making sure that you're hydrated. So there's more information on this, and um, it, that would be you know important for you to kind of take a look at it. We have some information if you're interested in how to breathe, self um, sort of talking to yourself, things of that sort, uh, you can do any of those things and that would be fine. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about culture of your organization. So as we go through this, think about the work that you do, the people that you support, and those that uh, are, support you. So I think what's most cr critical in this from an organizational standpoint cultural one is to think about these three things. How, how do you normalize the experience of psychological distress? It is normal to be distressed. It shouldn't be dismissed. Um, it shouldn't be sort of blown through. It needs to be acknowledged and it has to, we have to do something. It has to be an action point. So normalizing is one. Destigmatizing mental illnesses. Look, if you're feeling depressed or anxious and you're working somewhere, um, sometimes you just keep that uh, to yourself. And, and maybe it's perfectly fine to just say generally to staff, look, if you guys are feeling stressed, here's a resource, take the M5, you know, you're on your own, you can do that. But it's important as a culture in a company to, to not make people feel like if they say that they're anxious or depressed, they're going to be fired or they're going to be looked at um, as not helping out or seen in a negative way. Breaking down the barriers, look at your organization. Ask yourself honestly, if a worker, staff member really needs help, is there a system really in place? 
not just because you think so, but practically in place to make sure that they can get the help that they actually need. So recognizing that, um, look, there's an inherent risk in working with people, uh, residents in long-term care, working not only with the residents, but with um, other staff members. It's important that you as an organization admit that, recognize that. Um, that you check in with your staff. When was the last time you said, you know, it's just sat down with someone and said, how are you really doing here? I'm not saying that you should, you know, every day uh, have these checkpoints with your staff, but thinking about who's more vulnerable, you know, who really needs this. I mean, I would say at some level everyone needs it, but some need it more often than others. Is your organization really encouraging open communication? I mean, ask yourself that. I mean, is this a safe environment or is this sort of a, you know, you keep your head down and you keep going. Because if it is, over time, again, COVID-19 should be seen as a chronic situation, you're going to have problems. And it's going to result, the outcomes will be people will quit, the care will be less effective, um, there'll be more complaints and a whole list of other things. I'm going to advocate as a mental health doctor uh, that you really encourage self-screening. It can be totally private, uh, but you know, if you don't recognize that there's something going on here, um, there will be a problem later. It's like anything that's mechanistic, a car even. If a car is beginning to have problems, you probably shouldn't just pretend like there's no problem. Eventually, it's going to stop. What we know about the M5 is that if you have an elevated M5 score and you're coping fine, if it stays high, you're not going to be coping fine in three or four months. So should look at that as a warning sign. Access to psychosocial support, this can be done in lots of different ways. Uh, we have some resources for people if they want to use them. In your organization, you can build opportunities for psychosocial support, very important to be seen uh, in that way. Now, I had mentioned before that um, uh, there are a number of things that you can do. When I talked about stretch, I said exercise is really important, physical exercise is really important. And working memory exercises is really important. So working memory exercises, it speaks to a very specific um, set of cognitive domains in our brain, attention, memory, executive skills, and things like that. But they actually control a lot of things, like the expression of mood and function, a person's ability to do their ADLs, IADLs, things like that. So there is a brain health resource for you. It's free. It's this enrichvisits.com. It's really created for people to make sure that they keep their brains going and they improve their mood. It's a resource, so that's available. Um, now, also as a company, you know, it's important that you keep sharing accurate information about COVID-19. This has been a problem for many organizations, certainly in the beginning of the pandemic, partly because information was um, not always forthcoming and often contradictory, but in some cases, people really didn't want to share what they knew for fear of the impact on staff. So, you know, um, some knowledge, if it's the right knowledge, is better than no knowledge in most cases. So I would just say, keep those things in mind. Some other resources for you. I talked about this, um, uh, the CounterPoint Resource Center. You can, you can access that for lots of other things. I will also say that We've created um, these five free, the, you might think about them as, as one minute stress management videos. They can be texted to staff, emailed, whatever. And it's just, it's just a one minute, 60 to 90 seconds that says, okay, you know, maybe you're having information overload around COVID. Here are things that you can do. Or, you know, remember, remember to eat properly and hydrate. Uh, what, what kind of physical exercise should you be doing? How should you breathe? And cognitive exercises help. So if you want to access them, they're free and they're available for you. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, Allison, I, I said I would stop at 2.45 for questions. I think it's 2.48 Eastern time. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and put it on pause for a minute and see if there are specific questions or anything that I can respond to. Thank you so much, Dr. Mansbach. Yes, we want to invite questions from those in the group. Um, we have quite a few folks joining us, so please, if you have questions, you can you can put them into the chat box and we will get to them. Um, Dr. Mansbach, 
as we're as we're waiting for um, any questions or comments from our audience, um, thank you for sharing all of this. And and so much of it is so practical. I took many pages of notes. Some questions. Some folks have asked if the slides will be available, and um, and I believe you were okay with us sharing those, correct? Um, so I am sure. Share a PDF of those slides, so folks want to pull some of the key points and notes. Um, and another individual is asking if you can put the slide back up that had the information about the um, the resource center website. Can you go back to that page? Sure. Let me go to this one. Let me see. So resource center at counterpointhealthservices.com is how you get there. Did you want to see, um, I think I listed some of the resources that are on there. So, so let me go to that. So it's just resource center at counterpointhealthservices.com. Um, and so some of the things that you can find there are information on mood, on memory, what is dementia. We have a, a guide for families, for example, like, like what is dementia? And it's really around managing expectations, uh, I think, for family members. Um, what are the psychiatric disorders really? You know, so um, uh, because because people with dementia so often have um, co-occurring psychiatric issues, sometimes it's important to know. Well, is this really is this what's called a what BPSD, a behavioral psychological syndrome of dementia, or is this really something separate? And what do we really need to do about it? Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a question here from Erin. She's asking about um, if the M5 should be taken once or multiple times. So, so is this something that folks should be using or could potentially use on a regular basis? Or what are your thoughts on, on kind of um, ongoing screening? Yep. So that's a great question. The M5 is created as a process. Scale. What that means is that you can take it as often as you want. Not only that, we, we say in the last month, you know, answer these questions, but you can do it in the last week or in the last two weeks. So you can repeat it. So, so the M5 is not what's called a, a performance test, like let's say a BCAT test where you, you know, you ask people certain questions, they have to demonstrate whether or not they can do certain things like with memory or executive skills. It's not like that. It's, not, not in that way, it's actually an informant scale. So you basically are just being informed by how you answer the questions. You can take it as often as you want. There's no practice effect, there's no bias. Uh, and in fact, there's no bias anyway. There's not, there's not a um, education bias or race bias or um, um, any other bias that I can think of. Good question. Yeah, good question, Erin, thank you. Um, Dr. Mansbach, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more in detail about compassion fatigue specifically related to COVID-19. You made a comment that, um, that you know, we see more suffering now in COVID-19 than we have the ability to reduce or address in a lot of cases. Can you talk a bit more about kind of how compassion fatigue plays out and what are some effective ways that we can notice that in ourselves and our teammates and and what are some helpful things to address that yeah great question so um you know we have this tendency that if we feel like we can't go up we can't keep up we run faster and with uh, compassion fatigue the same thing happens so let me describe it in this way so we get into healthcare. we want to make a difference it's hard to do right so there's a tricky balance here but we generally do okay, right? Now, if the if the uh, suffering uh, gets a lot greater, we want to work harder, but we can't seem to have the same impact anymore. So, when that happens, the result is we begin to feel particularly anxious, uh, or in some cases, depressed. So, what you want to do about it is take a step back and say, "Well, wait a minute, you know." So, first, I have to acknowledge that. I may not be as impactful as I was before in the same way. For example, I might not be able to go, you know, I can't put my hand on someone's shoulder like I used to, for example. So I have to figure out a different way. Or, you know, 
I need to be reminded that there are other ways of meaningfully engaging with the residents or the patients that we're taking care of. So how do I do that? Do I now, for example, call a family member and then be able to say to a resident, I talked to, you know, your daughter, uh, Mary, who said, you know, she's doing fine. You shouldn't worry about her. So I think we have to acknowledge that, that, you know, when we're in a pandemic like this, we might not be as effective or effective in the same ways. And if we don't give ourselves permission to say, oh, okay, it's all right, that um, we're just going to get broken down. Organizations, Allison, have a responsibility and an opportunity to make that part of the culture. Thank you for addressing that. Um, really helpful to break that down a bit further. Um, sure. There's a question here about vacations and time off and how you know providers are, are short-staffed and um, time off and vacation can be really challenging to accommodate but they are so critically important. So can you share some thoughts on the importance of time away from work? And it's so interesting. There've been so many um, articles and podcasts about this topic of even folks who are working remotely, how the, you know, how Zoom meetings are, are actually more intense and can be more stressful than even in-person meetings and how folks feel so scheduled from, from the morning until night um, with little time to maybe have those really social interactions um, around the water cooler or the coffee pot or the break room. And I would guess that a lot of our, our folks in healthcare are, are facing that as well, even if they're in the same settings and they still are seeing the same people, it's a different dynamic. And so how, how, do, we, how do we encourage that time away? And, and just kind of, can you talk about the importance of that? Yeah, I love that question. So first thing is to acknowledge that that working from home is not being home. It's actually inserting work in home and it has its own stressors. So um, personal example. So I'm on a call with several people. One is from California. One is in Ohio. And I have these two large Rhodesian Ridgebacks behind me in my house. So I, I've got to present this information, right? So I do, and then someone uh, walks their dog outside our house, like uh, on the sidewalk, and our dogs go crazy. Well, that's really stressful. It's stressful because I'm beginning to see the dogs begin to ramp up before they actually do. So in some ways, if I was in my office, I wouldn't have that stress. It would be a lot easier. So, so my point here is that it's not like we're not working. It, it adds its own stress in some ways. If we can take, I think that, so, so the question of getting away from it, you know, recharging our battery is really critical. You, you can't, you know, go on vacation in the way that you used to. And if you have a staycation or you, or you work from home, it's no longer the same thing anymore. So now we have to begin to build, you know, how do you, how do you say, okay, uh, in a more normalized way, I'm going to for an hour. In fact, I would challenge people on this call. How often do you say, okay, so for an hour, I'm gonna make arrangements so that um, I'm not doing any work. I'm gonna do something. Maybe I'm gonna drive somewhere. Maybe I'm gonna go for a walk. Maybe I'm gonna do something where I'm not gonna do something that's work related. So it's, it's imperative that we get away from this from time to time. We can't hold our breath. You can't sprint through a marathon. We have to build places to rest and refuel. And some people feel really guilty about it. You know, like, well, you know, everyone's counting on me, blah, blah, blah. But we've got to be able to, you know, to do that. Now, other people are going to just uh, more aggressively, um, if they don't do that, they're going to break down. I'll put it that way and have to take time. But to take time for, for health reasons, physical health reasons, is a shame if it's a result of stress. So, so that's a whole topic, isn't it? But those are just some some initial thoughts about it. Yeah, I think we could probably do a whole day on that and how to manage the guilt yeah. of not being at work <laughs> right. and not being part of that team who's who's working so hard. But the time away is so incredibly vital. So thank you, um, Lisa, for bringing up that topic. We have a couple more questions here. Um, one around to determine which staff might need more frequent support, what might be some red flags or behaviors 
um, that we could look for to identify those staff members? Yeah, so I would start with the low hanging fruit, which is physical things. Um, use your eyes, use your ears. So if people just don't look like they normally do, they just seem, and, and again, so, so let's, let's first talk about it where, where people are actually in centers, in place, not, not at home. Um, uh, so if people just don't seem like, that's the constitutional assessment. You step back and you look at someone and pretend like they're not talking for a moment. And, and so, so you look at that. You look at whether or not there are certain complaints that are that are somatic, and and the classic ones are headaches, GI distress, um, fatigue, uh, lack of sleep, um, things of that sort. So the, you look at, you look at that, and I guess the third category is more in the psychological burden end, and and that gets expressed when um, either people seem anxious, they seem down. Or they're just not doing their work in the same way. You know, I don't mean the task, but actually the attitude. So, what is different here? Uh, I think that's really what you say to yourself. You should assume that a quarter of your workforce, it doesn't matter where you work, but you should assume that a quarter of your workforce, I'm not going to use the word impaired, but are operating significantly below what they normally would do because of these stress-related circumstances. In some environments, it's gonna be higher than that, but the rule of thumb is 25%. So, so your task is to figure out, well, among that, those 25% are gonna be the most vulnerable, how to identify them, and those would be some ways of doing that outside of using, let's say, the M5 or something of that sort. Thank you, great, great question. Um, we had a question here about the, um, the seventh step of stretch, but it looks like one of the other attendees answered the question. So it's hydrate. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So you, know like how, you know how I said, you know, the sleep is N plus one, you know, you're, you're supposed to get your normal night's sleep and add, add um, you know, add another hour of sleep, but hydration is the same thing. I mean, you, you really, you know, add, add that, the, that the plus one is another eight ounces. I mean, it's, Stress, it's, if you look at it, you know, physiologically, I mean, stress is dehydrating. So forget about the idea that you're wearing a mask and you're not drinking water and all that sort of thing. But I mean, just the act of being in a stressful situation is, is, is a dehydrating experience. It's a great reminder. Thank you so much. Dr. Mansbach, this has been incredibly helpful and practical, and we so appreciate your time and being willing to share these resources. And I invite folks to take a look at um, the the um, the resources that Dr. Mansbach shared, and we will post the recording of this session. I know that there were some folks who had trouble finding the correct link, and I apologize for that. And I see some of you have joined in the last 15 minutes. This entire session was recorded, so never fear; you will be able to to gather all of the information from the webinar. And if folks have additional questions, you can reach out to me at Leading Age Maryland, and I would be happy to connect you offline with Dr. Mansbach and his team. Um, and we want to thank everyone so much. And Dr. Mansbach, we would love to do a, a part two of this. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of interest and we'd love to find some additional ways to partner with you and your team. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed it. And, you know, everyone be safe and we'll get through this together. And uh, we, we, we just have some distance to go yet. We do. I love that line that you said you can't sprint through a marathon. You have to build in places to refuel. And that is a really practical, great way to to look at it. And I think um, hopefully all of us that are on the line will take some time to refuel this week so we can we can keep going. <laughs> OK, Thank very you. good. All right. Take okay. care. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.